The oceans are a graveyard of man's seafaring journeys. Today, underwater archaeologists are scanning the seafloor for clues to our maritime past. It's pretty amazing what can be reconstructed about people's lives by looking at the few artifacts. They look like trinkets to us today, but they help illustrate the past in ways that we haven't seen before. Some explorers are using state-of-the-art equipment to survey the bottom of the ocean. Others rely on skilled divers to map unknown shipwrecks. You have to have a trained eye. You have to look for those odd shapes, those colors that don't occur in nature. Every little piece down there is a piece of a map, a piece of a, a puzzle. It's like a detective story when you go down. You're getting all these little clues. Once retrieved, experts meticulously conserve centuries-old artifacts from their watery grave hoping to identify their origins. With history preserved in a liquid time capsule, what stories will archaeologists uncover? Can they piece together the past from tiny clues found today? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving. It's springtime in South Florida and members from the National Association of Black Scuba Divers, or NABS, are in Biscayne National Park for their annual DWP training workshop. DWP stands for Diving with a Purpose. Divers attend the week-long workshop that teaches volunteers some of the basic skills of underwater archaeology. Ken Stewart is the program's director and co-founder. In 2004, he created DWP with Biscayne National Park's former archaeologist, Brenda Lazendorf. She was the only person in the park and that uh, she needed some help. Located just south of Miami, a majority of the park's 173,000 acres is covered by water. Within its boundaries, there are approximately 75 known submerged archaeological sites. Anything that humans have modified and left behind is a, is a potentially is an archaeological site and potentially a significant one that tells the story of the park that we want to interpret. Chuck Lawson is the park's current archaeologist and sole member of the cultural resources team at Biscayne National Park. For the most part, I'm not able to mobilize a team big enough to do decent documentation on the shipwreck sites. So the DWP was created by my predecessor and the members of DWP to help augment the workforce at Biscayne National Park. Biscayne National Park has been working directly with DWP annually for eight years. We start out the first day with just kind of overview of archaeology, artifacts, and basic principles of underwater archaeology in general. In that afternoon, we do a mock wreck site. Swim to the other end. I'm going to come straight through here. We actually teach things that you will actually do in the water. We always have to make sure we have it taught. Mm -hmm. That's correct. This is 15. Right. Okay. So the first day is, is very intense, very long. The next morning, the DWPers load up and head to Leadbury Reef, an unidentified shipwreck that Chuck has selected for their training site. Okay. 
the biggest part of this training is actually diving on these wreck sites. Most shipwrecks uh, are scattered to debris fields. To an untrained eye, historical shipwrecks are often difficult to spot. Years of exposure can destroy a ship's structure, and with time, the remains are buried in sand or are overgrown with coral, making the archaeological research more challenging. When a ship first wrecks, there are a number of environmental factors that act upon their rapid deterioration. However, eventually, what's left of the archaeological site comes to equilibrium with the environment. And at that point in time, they may stay stable for hundreds of years. We're an agency with a mission to preserve and protect. We want to protect these sites in situ. Like I said, they're not at risk of deterioration unless they are manipulated. And it is only done after a lot of consideration on what the value in the research is. The first day we get in the water, we do what we call like a reconnaissance dive or just kind of get an overview of the size of the shipwreck. So we'll run a baseline, which is just basically a rope from one end to the other. And we try to run it down the middle of where all this debris field is. And we would split the wreck site up into four quadrants and we would actually assign teams to each one of those quadrants. We have DWP, Diving with a Purpose instructors, with each team that would be leading and teaching those students. We actually place what we call pin clips along the baseline, and the pin clips are in increments of feet, like 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet. Once the baseline and quadrants have been set up, the volunteers search the wreck site for objects that might be of historical significance. We have what we call pin flags that we place around the wreck. And we place those pin flags to areas of interest. It could be artifacts or pieces of the wreck. We have to know where those artifacts are in relation to the wreck, to the baseline. So we take what we call trilateration measurements. Basically, you measure the distance from that pin flag where that artifact is located to a baseline clip. You do two measurements and that actually will triangulate and tell you exactly where that particular artifact is. After measurements are taken, divers begin their in situ, or underwater drawings of the objects they flagged. These drawings will later be transferred to a large site map that illustrates the layout of the wreck site. After two days of diving, the volunteers return to the classroom. They discuss their findings, it clearly appeared to be a, a joint, double-ended, and it was made of metal. Refine their drawings. One, one, zero, six, eight, nine inches. And begin work on the site map, which depicts the entire wreck site. They're learning how to put the flag pin points on the map using a compass. That's an old-fashioned way, of course, I use a computer. So they can see how mapping is done. We used to do like little sketches on the site map too, but Gail Patrick, who's been working with us, she's an architect, and she has been able to take those student drawings, and scan them using a CAD tool, computer aided design tool, actually put those institute drawings on the maps themselves too. The volunteers continue diving and working in the classroom for several days until the site map is complete. The finished map is a valuable resource for park officials who can use it as a reference tool for management decisions. The first year, it was just three of us that finished the program. And I would say by the end of this year, well, I've trained almost 80 advocates in underwater archeology span in eight years. Denny Zulu Jean Tinney is a Miami artist whose creations are influenced by the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is the name that was given to the Atlantic, the transatlantic slave trade. Trade goods from Europe was taken to Africa, traded for people. The people were then transported across the ocean from the west coast of Africa to the Americas, 
and in the Americas, they were sold and the ships that were then loaded with the products of slave labor, uh, cotton, sugar, tobacco, indigo, rice, coffee, and so forth, and then taken back to Europe. Few artifacts from this brutal chapter in the history of the New World remain. In Key West, Florida, the Mel Fisher Maritime Heritage Society and Museum displays a rare collection of items recovered from a slave ship called the Henrietta Marie. Probably the signature artifact from the Henrietta Marie are the shackles. There are also a lot of trade goods, things like iron bars, glass beads, and pewter. And it was the first slave ship that really gives us a snapshot of what the slave trade was like, how it was organized, and how a slave ship functioned. First discovered in 1972 in the waters off Key West, the Henrietta Marie was finally identified nearly 10 years later when divers uncovered the ship's bell. In 1993, the National Association of Black Scuba Divers laid a plaque in sanctuary waters to honor those captives who were brutally transported aboard the Henrietta Marie. And the Henrietta Marie wasn't the only slave ship which sunk in Florida waters. More than a hundred years later, the Guerrero was sailing for Cuba with more than 500 captive Africans on board. When we look at the Henrietta Marie sailing in 1700, the slave trade was legal and it was an accepted business. When we look at a ship like Guerrero, that vessel's operating in entirely different circumstances. While slavery was still legal in the New World, several countries, including the United States, Great Britain, and Spain, banned the transatlantic transportation and sale of slaves by the early 1800s. However, demand for free labor was still high on Cuba's plantations, and the now illegal slave trade from Africa continued on pirate ships. At the time, the British Navy patrolled the waters for pirates. One evening in 1827, the British warship Nimble spotted the Guerrero and chased it towards Florida's coast. So Nimble started chasing them. They were going at a pretty good clip. Gun battle broke out. In the excitement, they weren't paying attention to where they were. They both slammed headlong into the reef. The Guerrero, her bottom was torn out. Her sails both flew forward and was finished, never moved again. 41 of the captured Africans perished when the ship went aground. The Nimble threw over iron ballast ingots, threw over cannon shot, just to lighten their load and be able to float off the reef. However, according to reports, the Nimble's anchor line parted, drifting them back onto the reef. The next morning, Salvage crews, known as wreckers, towed the British ship off the reef and provided aid to survivors aboard the Guerrero. That evening, the pirates who were on a couple of the wreckers rose up and wound up hijacking the wreckers and getting to Cuba anyway with 400 of the African people. The hijacked wreckers were eventually released and returned to Florida. 121 of the rescued slaves aboard a separate wrecker were brought to Key West. They were going to be liberated at some point from their intended slavery. That was the U.S. law. Years later, some of the rescued captives returned to Africa. Should be dead ahead. Today, archaeologists from the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary are trying to identify the Guerrero's final resting place. Luckily for researchers, the Nimble's captain took notes of their watery location, which was near modern-day Key Largo. He took a bearing from what was called Black Sarah's Creek, and he took another bearing 
from the Carries Fort light ship. With the help of archival records, researchers think they have located what used to be called Black Sarah's Creek, and from there have pinpointed potential wreck sites using a magnetometer. The magnetometer is a device that we use that measures variations in the Earth's magnetic field caused by iron, and that iron is either a shipwreck or cannons or anchors or something like that. We found four shipwrecks, but one in particular was pretty interesting. During one of the magnetometer surveys, experts discovered a large anchor. It matches exactly the sort of anchor that Nimble would have carried. It's the right size, it's the right date, doesn't have a name on it that we can see, but it matches everything. While they can't say for certain that the anchor belonged to the Nimble, researchers think it's likely, and they have started studying a nearby site they believe might be the Guerrero. They are joined in their efforts by the DWP volunteers who have been involved in the search for the Guerrero since 2010. This particular wreck is different from all the rest of them because there were slaves on this one when they went down. There weren't any slaves on the Henry and the Marie when they went down. For a lot of people, it was about being where their ancestors lay and just being a part of history. You know, it's the little clues that are making a difference on this wreck. The single fragment of pottery or the single bottleneck or the single piece of metal. You know, people have this cartoon notion of shipwrecks and they think that, you know, we dive down and there's a ship sitting there and there are skeletons laying on the deck and tattered sails and, you know, maybe a shark swimming in and out of the hull. That's for aquariums, you know, that's, uh, that's not real life. We're left with basically the hard things, the ballast stones, the iron fasteners, the fittings, copper nails, pottery, the glass, the things that the critters can't eat. One of the things that we know about the Guerrero is that its hull was sheathed with copper. We found pieces of copper sheeting crumpled and rolled up, copper corrodes in a very distinctive greenish way. This site is located in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, which aims to safeguard the maritime history found in its waters. In the Florida Keys, shipwrecks are protected. We want to have our next generations protect and promote the stories that lie within and around these ships that uh, came into the, the coast. By law, artifacts can't be brought to the surface without special permits. At times, permission is given to researchers to remove items for further study and conservation. During the 2010 expedition, select items from the wreck sites were brought to the conservation lab at the Mel Fisher Museum. What may have been a, a dish, you know, a full-size dinner plate is now a fragment of a full-size dinner plate. Because this has a scalloped edge like this, a sort of rough undulating edge, that was a style that reached its peak popularity in the 1820s. So that matches very closely with what we're looking for in the wrecks. Another piece that we recovered from the site is this glass bottleneck. It's from a very large glass jar called a demijohn. It was just completely covered with coral and algae. So to get it to this state required a fair amount of work, using a sharp blade and just sort of prying it off of there. We can't date it as precisely as we can, this blue and white ceramic, but nonetheless, it's pretty easy to imagine a, a big bottle of rum on board a pirate ship. Special care needs to be taken with each item to keep it from deteriorating after it has left the water. Every material type has its own conservation needs, so there's no one-size-fits-all treatment in the laboratory. With a metal object, we use what's called an air scribe, and it's this little tiny air-driven chisel that just chips the incrustation off a little bit at a time. Once that's done, it goes into a tank that has this electrochemical process. We call it electrolytic reduction, and, and really all it is doing is forcing the salt out of the metal because if we left them in, the combination of the salt, the oxygen, and the metal 
would just corrode the piece to the point that it was totally destroyed. Right now we have a shipwreck that we know is from the early part of the 1800s. It matches everything that we know about the Guerrero, but we don't have the smoking gun yet. We're looking for that one thing that will just cement the case for us. And you know, we go from thinking it's the Guerrero to knowing it's the Guerrero. Maritime archaeology is conducted in many different ways. In shallow water, divers can study a site. But in deep water, experts use high-tech tools to survey the seafloor. Jan Koblick and his team from the Aurora Trust map the ocean bottom with the side-scan sonar they like to call the fish. We let out enough tow cable so that the fish is 15 feet or so off the seafloor, and it emits sound signals out either side of the fish, and those sound signals reflect off of objects on the seafloor back to the fish, and they are registered as a target on their instruments here on the boat. When you emit that sound, it's called a ping, and every ping that comes back, you can display it across, it's like the scan lines on a TV. It all laces together and makes an image. Aurora, we started out doing archaeological work in the Mediterranean, finding shipwrecks. And then we set up an educational program to teach kids about the importance of the ocean through marine archaeology. The Aurora Trust, which specializes in underwater exploration, is also working in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. We're making a map of the bottom of the ocean that shows corals, geological features, and historical cultural features like shipwrecks. Using a low frequency signal, analysts can see up to 500 feet out from either side of the fish. Generally, we can see the difference between geology and something man-made with a high frequency. This is a big coral reef that's coming out right now. You know, we've got sand over here and there's a coral patch here and now there's a big coral reef here so we're coming into a strong reef area. These are sand ripples over in here. Today's technology allows us to go down with ROVs and everything is electronic so that you get a complete picture of what's on the bottom. An ROV or remotely operated vehicle allows technicians to get a closer and clearer view of objects that are hard to reach. It's a little robot at the end of the cable that swims around and is guided by an operator in the boat. Yeah, it looks like I have the bow of the wreck in sight. To demonstrate its abilities, Chris Olstad, an underwater technician for the Marine Resources Development Foundation, deploys the ROV on the Benwood wreck, a well-known dive site in the Keys. You have a thruster control, any way you push your joystick, the vehicle goes essentially. For vertical, you can tilt the camera up and down. You've got a focus adjustment. You've got lights here, good for night or diving in caves, maybe inside the wreck. We have a, uh, an option for a manipulator to uh, grab something at depth, bring it back. And I've also got a, a recorder here so I can record the video that uh, you're seeing on the monitor. This particular unit that I have right now, it goes down to 500 foot. Another model, the same size, goes down to 1,000 feet. Although remote sensing tools can provide incredible access to underwater sites, surveying the ocean bottom is tedious and time-consuming work. We have only begun. We're able to cover about a half a square mile a day. We've been out about 10 days, so we have a long ways to go. This is a great opportunity to continue on with something that I think makes a contribution to society and to history, and I love to do it anyway. Shipwrecks and maritime archaeology, I think, brings history to life in a way that people can't imagine.
there's a story behind each ship. Uh, some of them, it tells where they were coming from and what they were carrying. The remains of these ships are a vital part of the Keys history. You know, we can read about the slave trade all we want, but when you have something that you know was on board a slave ship or was held in a pirate's hand, that is powerful and it makes it that much more real. With countless artifacts strewn across the oceans, researchers will continue to scour the seafloor in hopes of uncovering and confirming stories of our past. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving.